Uh, as Billy mentioned, I've been here for a while, and I might be a familiar face to many of you, but you don't know what I actually do. I think a lot of you go, hey, that Dave guy, it's in his job to go to the aquarium and play with the animals, which, if true, would be a pretty cool job description. But I'm actually a research associate here at IOF, and my job is to use physiology to try to improve the management and recovery of endangered species. Now, many of the animals I work with are marine mammals and other animals under human care. So today what I'd, do, I'd like to do is give you a, a glimpse into that world by talking about one of those laboratory rodents, the stellar sea lion, and how studying them under controlled conditions can actually help uh, safeguard them and conserve them in the wild. Now, there's a myriad of challenges facing vertebrates in our oceans. I don't know what the definitive list is, but I don't think anyone's going to have too many uh, complaints about the ones that I put together. And the one thing these all have in common, of course, is they have the proven capacity to be detrimental to populations of vertebrates in our oceans, whether we're talking about fish or seabirds or indeed marine mammals. Now, the interesting thing about that is Arnold Licks, who happens to be one of the grandfathers of marine mammal science, recently stated, it, disturbance doesn't affect populations. What it does is it affects the individuals within that population. And so that's where our focus has to be. What is the effects of these disturbance on individuals? We've come to realize that and put a number of conceptual models together to try to address what the potential effects are of disturbances. This is a uh, figure showing the Picod model, which is quite, has nothing to do with the fish, Pacific Cod, it's just called the Picod model. And it looks at the effects on the individual's physiology and behavior, how that might affect, be affected by some disturbance, how that ultimately might affect their vital rates, and only through that do we actually get population changes. Now, the ability of an individual animal to withstand some sort of environmental disturbance is largely set by their behavioral and physiological c capacity to adapt to whatever that disturbance is. And as a physiologist, of course, I'm going to say physiology is the most important of those two. Because physiology ultimately constrains your behavioral options. Physiology is the way we measure the costs or the effects to an individual animal. Um, understanding the basic underlying physiological mechanisms is the way that we can predict how the behavior and the health of animals might change to future environmental impacts. So how do we know how an environment might be affecting an individual animal? Well, as scientists, we have a number of tools. One tool is to model the system. We do computer models or mathematical models. This is something we do a lot of in this building, and that's a fantastic tool because we can test specific hypotheses, we're almost unlimited in the scope of our studies. Any system, we can model it. We're not limited logistically or financially. But, of course, the accuracy of those systems is reliant on the data we put into it. Where do we get this data? Well, one of the primary sources is studying animals in the wild. This is great. This is what the animals are actually encountering. This is how they're actually behaving, whether physiologically or behaviorally. So it's realistic. But when you're talking about particularly large animals or animals that are hard to work with, you're logistically and financially limited in the types of studies you can do. Perhaps more importantly, you're limited in the type of data you can collect. Correlation only, no cause and effect. You also can't look at future environmental disturbances because they're not happening at that time. So a third tool in our toolbox is looking at animals in the laboratory setting. Again, we can test specific hypotheses of how things might work. It's providing data into things like conceptual models. And the strength and the weakness of this is that it's an unnatural condition. So the strength is it's a controlled condition we can do empirical experiments with, but that's the downside. It's artificial. So we have to be careful extrapolating our results and the questions we sort of ask and how that might relate to their wild counterparts, which is usually what we're most interested in. So here's some quotes that I've pulled from papers. Um, didn't necessarily suck up on the top quote, but it doesn't hurt. Um, that are uh, reporting some potential mechanisms for how environmental disturbance, in these three cases that just happens to be climate change, because that's hot in the news, and how they might affect individuals and populations. 
And I would argue that all these potential disturbances are in fact describing physiological mechanisms. And in fact, because of that, they're testable hypotheses for how the environment might affect individual physiology. And I don't think it'd be too controversial to say, well, then we can take those hypothesized physiological changes or mechanisms and test them in a laboratory. That's certainly something we'd be comfortable doing with fish or corals. It's not as acceptable when we're talking about large mammals. There's various reasons for that. These are pictures of two animals that I've worked a lot with, Stella sea lions on the left and northern fur seals. And that's essentially what I do a large part of my time is I do laboratory studies with these animals that I think parallel stuff that we'd find acceptable with fish populations. And so what I'm going to be spending my talk doing is talking about one of these species, stellar sea lions, to try to show you how animals under managed care can be used to answer questions about their wild counterparts and ultimately the population conflict. So let's get to know our friend, the stellar sea lion. They're the largest of the sea lions. Males weigh a ton, which is, think, a car. Females are petite, 300 kilograms. They range throughout the North Pacific. And you see that dotted line about middle of Alaska. That's a differentiation between, well, sometimes we call them populations. Technically, we're supposed to call them distinct population segments based on genetics. And the reason that's important is because what happened to the population, starting about the mid-1980s, we think, the western population, where traditionally most of the stellar sea lions were found, started a precipitous decline, almost unheard of among large mammalian species. The eastern population sort of trundled along, continued its slow increase, and if we extended that line out to present day, the eastern population is actually larger than the western population. Now there's been a number of hypotheses, reasons for what might have caused that decline. My lab, I tend to concentrate on things related to their food supply and the reasons their food supply might have changed and wiped out the stellar sea lions. There's a couple of primary lines of evidence why I went down this road, one of which is illustrated here. On the y-axis, we have population change, and this is regional population change. So when I talk about populations going down among the western uh, population, it didn't all happen the same way at the same time. There's regional differences. So at the top of the y-axis, we have popul local populations that are increasing. At the bottom, we have populations that are decreasing over a set time period. On the x-axis, we have a measurement of their diet. In this case, it happens to be the average uh, energy density of what the animals are eating in the summer. And it was observed there's a reasonable relationship where the animals in the top right, populations are increasing, and they're eating a high-energy diet that is also very diverse, so a lot of different species. And then the bottom left, we have the losers. Populations are going down. They happen to be eating a low energy diet that is dominated by one or two different prey items. The other piece of evidence came about by the fact that it's not just stellar sea lions and northern fur seals that are declining across the North Pacific. The number of seabird populations that are reliant on forage fish that are also declining over the same time period. Now, with seabirds, the link between prey and success is a little clear because we can actually measure what the seabirds are bringing back to the nest for their chicks. And we've noticed over time that the energy value of the fish that they're bringing back has gone down, the energy density, because they're limited in the number of fish they can fly back with. So they can't catch more fish and bring it back to the chicks. And it's directly related ultimately to the fledging success of those chicks. So the connection's a little more clear in this case. The idea that there might be a discrepancy between the needs of stellar sea lions and what their food is providing them became known as the nutritional stress hypothesis. And actually, that's several hypotheses in one, but we don't need to get into that. And it's basically a case of nutritional imbalancing. Now, when I talk about nutrition, nutrition is a broad thing. We study many aspects of nutrition. I'm just going to be talking about energy in this talk. And so the nutritional stress hypothesis basically said something changed in the food and negatively affected the stellar sea lions. And the overall arching question is, how would that happen? What's the actual mechanism for changes in prey abundance, type, or distribution that would negatively impact the animals? And that big question raises several smaller questions that you can actually investigate. How much energy do a, does a sea lion need? 
What kind of fish do they eat? What kind of fish should they be eating? Um, what is the cost of catching those fish? And how does that change with changes in the distribution or abundance of different types of fish? And finally, what is the effect on individual animals if they don't get sufficient nutrition? This really comes down to a, a balance model. On one side, we have the sea lion. On the other side, we have the fish. We're going to start on the left side, which are trying to figure out what the needs are of a sea lion. That's where a lot of the early work took place in my lab, quantifying the energy costs of different parts of an animal's energy budget. So we have things we can measure the growth and condition on our animals, because they're trained and they'll do measurements for us, costs of thermoregulation, resting metabolism, which for those of you who saw my talk this morning, you know what that is, uh, locomotion and activity. We can also measure the interactions between these different costs because physiology is complicated. Now, on the top left there, you see locomotion. Measuring locomotion of a stellar sea lion in the wild. That is true for the first year of life, where we had them in this swim mill. After that, I'm lying. Marine mammals are really good at swimming and diving. And I don't care how big your aquarium is, your tanks aren't going to be big enough to measure that for a marine mammal. Fortunately, about 15 years ago, we opened the UBC Open Water Research Lab where we have our sea lions and they can swim and dive unrestrained in the open ocean. So we can actually measure those costs and those behaviors unrestrained by the physical constraints of an aquarium tank. The other thing we can do as a bit of a side note is we can actually measure their energy expenditure and come up with devices and techniques so we can measure that on wild animals as well. I'll get in a little bit more about the open water station and the stuff we can do later on in the talk. Another important aspect of doing all these measurements is because we can measure all these different components of an animal's energy budget, what we could do is we could also construct uh, predictive bioenergetic models of how much energy an animal requires at different times of the year, different life history stages, different reproductive stages. And all that work came down to a few salient points. So first of all, we have the construction of testable bioenergetic models. And I talked about it a little bit this morning, but just the fact that we have to remember these models are just those. Those are testable uh, constructs. We have, however, uh, quantified and determined the variation, the seasonal variation in their energy budgets, which means how much food they're going to require at different times of the year. We've quantified that the energy requirements and the food intake don't always match up, so you have to measure both of them. And we've also identified priority periods of growth. This is very important when you're talking about life history. We've identified periods in their life history where if they're not getting sufficient food intake at that point, it can have very long-lasting detrimental effects on things like uh, reproductive capacity or final size. On the other side of the equation, of course, we have the We know what the sea lions require. Let's figure out what the, the prey gives us. And surprising to a lot of people who model ecosystems for marine mammals, there are differences between fish. They are not ge generic. Um, there's huge differences in the energy density and nutritional value across species, so something like a herring compared to a walleye pollock. And importantly, there's also differences within a species throughout the year and throughout the life history stages. So a salmon has different energy content depending on when the sea lion is eating it. Now, pollock is important because not only is it the, probably the largest fishing industry in the world, depending on how you quantify it, certainly the most important in the North Pacific, um, but for the same reasons that the pollock industry is trying to sell it to humans in that, i.e., it's low fat and therefore good for you, it's not, but that's what they're selling, um, is the same reason it's really bad for marine mammals, because the marine mammal need those lipids in their diet. Now, how do we know what they're eating in the wild? Well, we can validate methods, again, with our captive animals. So we know what they're eating. And we can measure what comes out the other side. So we can do traditional uh, indices, like uh, what comes out in the scat, the hard parts, and say, OK, we know what came in, what biases uh, might we be getting if we collect that scat on a rookery and we think we know what the animal is eating? But it also develop new techniques 
for looking at diet over different time courses and with different accuracy. So things like fatty acids in the tissue, stable isotopes in the tissue, and DNA in the scat, which not only gives us a better picture of what they're eating, but we can actually tell what the predator is from these nondescript scat samples that we might get off. Now, to understand the chemical energy contained in a fish, you don't need a sea lion. You don't need to do any studies. You just need a laboratory. But if you want to know what the nutritional value of those fish are to a real animal, you have to process it through an animal. And that means looking at the differentiation between gross energy, which is what is going in in the fish, and what the animal is using. Unfortunately, to figure out what the animal is retaining, you have to measure everything it's not retaining. So this is all digestive waste that has to be accounted for. And the bottom line is, through all the studies that we've done on this, if the animal is eating, the sea lion is eating low quality prey, it has a proportionally higher cost to digest. So they're going to be having difficulty getting enough nutrition from a low quality prey, and their digestive system is going to make that even tougher, sufficient nutrition and energy. So, on one side we have the sea lion, on the other side we have the amount of fish that's consuming. But of course, unfortunately for wild sea lions, fish isn't just served up on a silver platter or a silver scale. They have to go out and get that. How can we possibly measure that? Well, again, we have the open water research station. What this allows us to do is not only look at the cost of foraging and diving, but also how the behavior and physiology change in response to changes in that prey field. This is how we do it. This is a schematic for open water research site. Here's my purple stellar sea lion. We have these feeding tubes that go down into the water. We can put them down to up to 50 meters. We can change the depth of these tubes, and we can change the frequency and size of the fish coming out of those tubes. So we can alter uh, the depth that the animal has to forage at, and we can alter the quality of the prey patch. I've got some video to show you exactly how that works. I figure at this point you're probably nodding off a bit. So this is our open water research facility in Port Moody. Uh, this is one of our stellar sea lions. You'll notice she's wearing a safety harvest, harness. Uh, that's because there is boat traffic nearby, but also on this harness we can mount various bits of equipment. In this case, we happen to have a GoPro, among other things, so we can measure the behavior of these animals. And the important thing is they start and end each of their dives in this respirometry dome, so we can measure their oxygen consumption and therefore what those dives cost. And we set up the trial with these feeding tubes under different conditions, whatever the experiment happens. Uh, the professional training staff send them on their way. They go and forage at the bottom. Now, Sometimes the sea lion sets its own diving behavior. Sometimes we control the diving behavior. Experimental question that we're asking. Uh, they usually stay down for longer than this. We've edited the video. And the, the key thing and the big training protocol for them is not eating fish at the bottom, which is pretty good for them, but starting and ending every dive in a sequence within that respirometry dome. The other great thing we can do with these animals is we can measure all sorts of other physiological parameters at the same time. We'll just see a picture of this at the end of a trial. And they'll come out on um, our diving platform, and that's where we can take other physical measurements as well. We can draw blood samples immediately after dive, or do ultrasounds, or whatever measurements we want. So that allows us to uh, determine, through experimental means, how things like prey density or prey depth might alter their behavior and costs. And some of the main results we found is sea lions are lousy divers. They barely qualify as marine mammals. Now, we kind of knew this from looking at behavior of sea lions in the wild. They rarely dive deeper than 50 meters and rarely over two minutes. And that's because that's really their capacity for an easy dive. The good news for a sea lion is if they're diving short, shallow dives, it's really efficient. They don't expend a lot of energy. They stay on that fish target so they can gobble up lots of fish with minimal costs. If they have to go deeper or stay longer, it has several costs. They're less efficient. The energy expenditure is higher. They're spending more time in transit, getting to and from those costs. And then they have to recover from those dives at the surface, which is time that they can't spend foraging. What happens when we change the prey field? Well, we know that um, 
decreasing food availability actually makes them even less efficient. So when they have to forage harder because the food is less available at depth, their ability to fill their uh, food requirements on that prey patch becomes even more difficult. The other thing that was threw us for a loop at first is when they're nutritionally stressed, so when we've experimentally um, dropped their weight, they actually have a higher capacity physiologically for diving for some weird mechanisms I won't get into. But the way they actually dive, they become less efficient, partly because they've altered their behavior into a less efficient mode because they really, really want that fish. And that's a higher priority than their foraging efficiency. So we've shown how of efficiency or the net value of prey can go down with the type of prey. Some prey are going to have higher costs. And all of those combined mean, well, the sea lion needs more fish. Well, so what? I mean, why don't they just eat more fish? Assuming the fish is there in the ocean, and usually there's quite a bit of fish in the ocean, what's the big deal if they have to eat more fish? Well, we asked that same question. We did say called the satiation trials or the pig trials, where our sea lions got to eat as much as they wanted. And we changed how frequently they were allowed to eat. We changed the type of food because we want to know how readily they would alter their behavior to compensate for that. And the bottom line is really well. They changed their eating behavior to compensate for how often they were getting food, whether it was daily or every other day, or the type of food they were getting, whether it was high or low energy density. So they have a great capacity to alter their food intake to meet their requirements. Problem is, it's a limited capacity. And it's limited by their innate physiology and anatomy. There is only so much food these guys can ingest and process on a regular basis. Believe me, they try to maximize that out. So what happens if the requirements of the sea lion are greater than what it can satisfy by either ingestion or the fish just isn't available. Does that mean dead sea lions wash up on the shore? No, it's probably not that simple. There is a, we document a whole series of physiological changes that happen. So not surprisingly, an energy deficit leads to changes in body mass. When you lose body mass in your marine mammal or a human, you tend to lose body fat. That's OK if you're a marine mammal. That's what the body fat is there for. It's an energy reserve. The problem starts to develop if you lose too much fat or if you're losing body mass on a low lipid diet. So you may have heard for humans, one of the ways to lose that visceral fat is to go on a low fat diet. And you'll burn more of that fat. And the same is true, in a way, for marine mammals. The problem is marine mammals need that fat. They need some level of fat. If they burn too much fat, it's also affecting their insulation, because that's the other job that subcutaneous lipids do. They keep them warm. What happens when you use that insulation? Your thermoregulatory costs go up, and that can increase your net energy deficit, and that just turns you into a downward spiral. So what we've, um, oh, the other thing we've found, sorry, um, we've, we've also noticed when we've been calculating these energy needs, that the energy demands and prey quality, so both the energy demands change seasonally, how much uh, fish they need, and then that sometimes overlaps with these big changes in prey quality. And for some animals at certain times of the year, when their food requirements are highest, that is corresponding to when fish quality is actually lowest. Um, we also know the effects of nutritional stress physiologically are highly seasonal. We think that relates to what they might be expecting in the wild. So, if you're experimentally nutritionally stressing them at a time of year when that might happen in nature, the effects are not nearly as drastic as if you do it at a time of year when you're theologically equipped, predisposed to ride that out. And then the other thing is we've also looked at what's the animal's ability to recover from nutritional stress, because that's almost as important as the impact of nutritional stress. And that is highly seasonal as well, and not always at the same time. So there's certain times of the year when it might be better to undergo the nutritional stress, but on the other hand, it's harder to recover from that. How do we know when an animal's nutritionally stressed? Well, besides the fact we nutritionally stress them in the lab, we've been able to put together a broad um, list of physiological markers, such as changes in blood profiles, changes in hormones, how to measure body fat effectively, um, how to measure their ability to thermoregulate through uh, thermal imaging, 
that um, we can then apply to animals in the wild. Because the big question in the field up to this point is, okay, are these animals nutritionally stressed? I don't know, some of them look fatter, some of them look thinner. You're suggesting that animals in the wild are nutritionally stressed. We don't know how to interpret blood values because they're not moose and they're not domestic dogs. Well, now we know how to interpret those values because we know the nutritional state of our experimental animals. So, to summarize what we found in the laboratory up to this point, using my fantastic art skills, there's plenty of different fish in the sea. Our hypothesis of decline of sea lions appears to be related in some respect to their diet. There is nutritionally good and nutritionally marginal sea lion food. I'm not saying bad sea lion food. Okay? It's just food that's going to make it harder to get through the air or to make a living. Okay? Sea lions can alter their foraging behavior in response to prey quality. They're not idiots. If it's less food or it's lower quality, they can catch more if it's out there. They can also alter their foraging response to changes in prey availability. availability. So if it's more dispersed or there's less abundance. But it's at a cost. We can model how prey demands change with the type of prey, the season, the gender, and the activity levels of the animal. We can have high predictions of what they might require. And we can say if intake is sufficient, if they can match the nutritional needs, prey quality within the realms of what they're actually eating in the wild doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't have an overall effect. Pollock is not killing them. Okay? But they do need to eat a lot more, and that might be pushing some off the edge. If intake is insufficient, low-quality prey has additional health effects on the physiology. And we now know what to look for. So I've described sort of the top two part, which has been the bulk of our research to date, how to changes in food affect the physiology or health of individual animals. But of course, I start off talking about, well, that's ultimately going to lead to impacts on life history. And if I mention that's not killing animals, well, what, is, what might it actually be doing? And that's a, an entire field of research that we're undertaking. And we're looking at whether this nutritional deficit make them more susceptible to disease, pollution, parasites, or even predation. They have to forage longer. They're exposing themselves to predation longer. The other thing we're looking at is the effect of reproduction. So this would be survival. is another thing. Um, we're starting to observe in the field that when times are poor, uh, females will buffer their pups that they're nursing against environmental disturbance. One of the ways they do that, though, is they will actually preclude mating or giving birth every year. So they could be effectively cutting the birth rate by half, but it's not like you're seeing dead pups on the beach or anything. Right? There's just a strategy for them overcoming that. It's not unusual in large mammals. The one thing I did want to touch on, because this is an institute for the oceans and fisheries, and one of the questions I, I frequently get asked is, well, how does this relate to fisheries? And it's through maps like this. Uh, these are maps of exclusion zones in western Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And it relates to the Pollock fishery, which is uh, 2012 was $1.7 billion. There is a legal conflict between stellar sea lions and the Pollock fishery because it's an endangered species. And so there have to be these exclusion zones placed to make sure that fisheries do not impact stellar sea lions. How do you make these exclusion zones make sense? Well, you have to know what stellar sea lions need, when they need it, what time of year, and where they're foraging so that you can make sensible management decisions on both the fisheries and the marine mammal side. And finally, I'd just like to say um, it takes a village, literally, to, uh, to do some of this research. Obviously, didn't do much of it uh, myself or all of it myself. And there's a whole team of researchers and graduate students who've helped produce those results. And of course, it's expensive doing marine mammal research. And I'd like to acknowledge those who've been foolish enough to fund it. Thank you. <laughs>